right, wonderful. So again, uh, thank you for that introduction. My name is Noah, uh, and I think I forgot to mention in the introduction, but I'm also studying physics and math uh, at North Carolina State University. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking about, uh, as it says here, science in the stellar graveyard. Um, and more specifically, kind of a broad overview of what that means uh, and kind of my journey to actually doing that kind of science. Uh, so the stellar graveyard isn't as spooky as you might think. Uh, it's the domain of the deaths of stars, also called supernovae, uh, and their remnants in the form of things like neutron stars and black holes. Maybe you've heard of these before, but if you haven't, uh, neutron stars are these super dense remains of a star after it's died, uh, made up of all kinds of nuclear weirdness. And black holes are their even denser cousins uh, from which no light can escape. Uh, so these are crazy objects, and thus the stellar graveyard represents the most extreme frontier of modern science as these are violent astrophysical laboratories that push our understanding of physics to its very limits. And in my undergraduate career, I've had the privilege of being able to use these laboratories to study the fundamental nature of things like nuclear physics and gravity itself. But how do we actually study these laboratories, right? They're very far away. These are strange objects, objects that we don't fully understand. Uh, and you know, having already done science, y'all already have an idea of what it means to study something. You come up with some quantity you want to observe. You find a way to observe that quantity because you think it will tell you something about your physical system. Like you might use a microscope to study a cell or a telescope to study a star. But recently we actually discovered a new way to study these systems uh, using ripples in the very fabric of space-time itself called gravitational waves. It turns out that when two black holes or two neutron stars merge together, they send out these ripples in the very gravitational firmament of the universe, causing space to stretch and squeeze in a periodic fashion. The intensity and patterns of these ripples, of this stretching and squeezing, is actually determined by the property of the black holes or neutron stars that merged, and there's an added benefit of, unlike light from a star, gravitational waves won't be blocked by material in between us and the source of the signal. And so these are really cool signals that we can use to probe these astrophysical laboratories. Now, by the time these waves reach Earth, they're very, very, very tiny, causing space to stretch and squeeze uh, on the order of one one thousandth of a proton, so incredibly small distances. And that means they're pretty hard to detect, but not impossible. And so the question is, how do we actually detect these? Well, it's a combination of high-powered lasers and fancy guess and check. Uh, it turns out that if you want to detect a gravitational wave, you need to detect a very, very tiny change in distance. Because again, space is stretching and squeezing in a periodic fashion. And to do that, we use something called a laser interferometer. And basically, these are two lasers in a big L shape. Uh, and using a complex system of mirrors and quadruple pendulums and vacuum chambers and all kinds of fancy equipment, we can measure the distance along these arms extremely precisely. And so as a gravitational wave passes through and stretches out one arm and squeezes the other, we can detect those tiny changes in distance and say, oh, we've detected a signal. Right now, there are actually four of these in the world. So there are two of these gravitational wave detectors in the US, one in Italy, and one in Japan, with more being built all the time. Now, they aren't perfect. These aren't perfect devices. It's really hard to measure distance and see changes in distance, much less than a proton. But in 2015, we were actually able to detect gravitational waves from a binary black hole merger for the first time. Two black holes spiraled in at nearly the speed of light and merged together into a bigger black hole. And this was an incredible scientific event. But now we want to know things like how large were the merging black holes? Where were they in the universe? But if you didn't already know, physics is pretty hard. And most of these events are really far away. And so even as we try to answer these questions, we're never 100% certain about our answers. Um, now, I'm not sure how y'all approach a hard physics or math problem, but what I usually do is guess and check. I come up with a good, an answer I think might be right. I might have some intuition for what the answer might be. And then I use the physics and math I've already learned to see if that's a reasonable guess, to see if it matches my assumptions 
about how a certain physical system works. Um, well, a computer can do this same process, but millions of times a second, much faster than I can. And so when we're not entirely certain about our answer to a scientific question, we can instead use the science we currently understand to make rules for how to come up with a good guess and how to check it, and then tell the computer to use those rules and come up with a bunch of guesses and tell us how good it thinks those guesses are. And in this way, we construct a distribution of possible answers to our question, a statistical distribution. Uh, and if you haven't heard of it before, this process is actually called Bayesian inference. And so that's how, once we, with our fancy lasers, determine we've heard a gravitational wave signal, that's how we actually turn that into scientific understanding. In my own research, I've actually been working on modifying a little bit this guess and check process so that we can test for really tiny deviations uh, due to changes in our understanding of gravity in a gravitational wave signal. Uh, but I didn't want to focus too much on my specific research today. And if you're happy, it was actually just made public, so I'll drop it in the chat in a moment. But I wanted to talk how I got there. Um, I didn't actually learn a lot of these skills or this science in the classroom, which often felt really stressful, both before I started research uh, in college and even while doing it. Like, I don't know what's going on. But every step of the way, I felt like there is a kind of science mountain in front of me, like composed of all of the knowledge and things that I don't know, and I can't even see the top. And that'll only really be a real scientist which I've reached the top. But of all the random physics and math that I've learned, the most important thing I've actually learned is how harmful this mindset is. Just like climbing, science is step by step. And it turns out that during all of those times that I felt so intimidated by all of the things I don't know, by my lack of experience, by the failures I experienced, I was actually learning new things that I'm still using today. Like I have two examples of some of my very first science projects. On the left was one I actually did for my middle school science fair way back in 2013. Um, I tried to, you know, test thermodynamic properties of random liquids I could find in my kitchen, like vinegar or chocolate syrup, but I didn't know thermodynamics, and I didn't have a well-formed scientific hypothesis, and so the project both failed and wasn't super interesting, and I felt so bad about it, but I actually learned a lot of things, like how do you take good notes in the process of doing science? How do you come up with new hypotheses as your old ones fail? Or on the right, uh, I have one of the earliest prototypes of an air quality sensor I tried to build. I wanted to measure air quality in my hometown, but I didn't know how. So I built one from scratch. I put some electronics in a box, like put it in an Amazon delivery package, taped it all up, and then it rained. And I'm like, well, that's not going to work. So I'm like, but what if I put it in a plastic trash bag? Like, okay, that'll protect it from the rain, but then I can't get air in. So what do I do then? And I kept trying things and ultimately the prototype failed anyway. But I learned a lot, not only about, you know, how do I program, but how do I try out new scientific ideas in the face of continued failure? And I still use these same skills to this very day. And so all that is to say, I couldn't have navigated the stellar graveyard without any of these experiences. And even now, the things all of you are doing at this science fair and elsewhere are preparing you for whatever next research or other kind of endeavor you do. In your research, you'll find unexpected connections everywhere. Like I couldn't have imagined that studying air quality in my hometown would help me test general relativity with astrostatistics, but indeed it does. And so for all of my fellow scientists here today, I wanted to emphasize that being a scientist isn't about reaching the top of that mountain, but by using all of your unique experiences and knowledge to find a way to the next step. Uh, so studying the, cell, uh, studying the stellar graveyard might be the kind of scientific journey you'll embark upon, but regardless, it connects us all. Uh, because it turns out that when stars die, they leave behind stardust composed of all of the heavy elements necessary for life. And so in the words of Vera Rubin, one of the most influential astronomers of the 20th century, uh, each one of you can change the world for you are made of star stuff and you are connected to the universe. Thank you.